Imagine becoming a widow at 14 or 15 years of age. Here's how Pandita Ramabai described the plight of teenage widows she observed while growing up in 19th century India. Girls of 14 and 15 who hardly know the reason why they are so cruelly deprived of everything they like are often seen wearing sad countenances, their eyes swollen from shedding bitter tears. They are glad to find a dark corner where they may hide their faces as if they had done something shameful and criminal. The widow must wear a single coarse garment, white, red, or brown. She must eat only one meal during the 24 hours of a day. She must never take part in family feasts and jubilees with others. We're about to hear how this generation of young widows began to discover hope. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Choosing Forgiveness. For May 23rd, 2022, I'm Dana Gresh. Well, I don't have to tell you that there's a whole lot of pain and injustice taking place in our world today. I heard a piece on the news not too long ago discussing the whole thing of medical waste companies transporting fetal remains. And just the thought of this was like so saddening and horrifying to me to think of all that is behind that, even though it's not so uncommon anymore, it's still a tragedy. And issues of the human trafficking that come into the news and on the landscape, far too often millions of Ukrainian refugees Women and children being brutalized in the middle of war, cities being overrun with crime, fentanyl and opioids being smuggled into our country and causing tens and maybe hundreds of thousands of deaths, while just to name a few of the kinds of issues we're confronted with day after day. So Dana, how do we respond to these kinds of injustices? Well, how do we respond and how are we responding? They might be different questions because I think a lot of people are looking at this long list and they're assuming there's nothing I can do. They feel helpless. They don't know what to do. So they do nothing. Yes. Or we can get so used to seeing these images and hearing about these atrocities that we stop noticing them. We get numb. We end up feeling nothing. It's just too much to feel. And we've probably all had both that sense of feeling helpless and feeling numb. Well, today we're going to hear a story that's going to challenge both of those responses. That's right. Pandita Ramabai grew up in India in the late 1800s. And anyone hearing about her birth would assume it was just an unremarkable event. Girls weren't valued in that society. Women were basically treated as property of their fathers or husbands. But God used Pandita Ramabai to change the life of thousands of women in India and to challenge unjust practices. Yes, this is a remarkable life. And as we listen to this story, I want to encourage you to ask, how might God want to use me as an instrument of grace? How might He want to use me to challenge some injustices that are taking place in our day? You know, I first learned about Pandita Ramabai when I was just a little girl. The Christian school I attended, Delaware County Christian School in the Philadelphia area, supported the ministry of Ramabai Mukti Mission, as it was called in those days. It was and is a Christ-centered home that cares for destitute women and children. We're going to hear more about that outreach in the program today, but I can remember there as a child in this Christian school how we prayed for this outreach. We prayed for this mission. We prayed for the women and children. We heard updates from the ministry, and we supported their work. And it's stuck in my head now, 50-some years later, I still have a heart for that ministry. Wow, that's so cool, Nancy. And you know, I'm just wondering how many grandmothers and mothers are planting seeds like that in the hearts of their children as they support ministries like this mission. And I hope that even more of that will happen as a result of a short new book from Revive Our Hearts that's called Unremarkable. And one of the 10 women featured in that book is Pandita Ramabai who was the founder of that ministry. You're going to learn lots more about her today, and I hope it will inspire a new generation of older and younger women. 
I'm really excited about this new book, Nancy. The title, Unremarkable, in that title, the un is in parentheses. And it's a play on words to remind us God can do remarkable things through regular women like you and me. Erin Davis served as one of the editors for the booklet, Unremarkable, and she's here today to tell us about Pandita Ramabai. Hi, Erin. Hey, Dana. I cannot wait to hear this story. Mm, Well, like you said, Pandita Ramabai was born in the late 1800s, and she was born into the Brahmin caste. And to understand her life, you do need to understand the caste system that she was born into. Is that caste as in C-A-S-T-E? Right, not like the caste that goes on your broken arm. (laughs) Now, we're used to saying we have a middle class and a working class, but the caste system in India was much more rigid. If you were born into the lowest caste, you basically had to be a slave to the other castes. In Hindu teaching, people in this lowest caste had no hope for salvation. Here's how Pandita Ramabai described the plight of low caste people. We have an actress reading from one of her books. As for the low caste people, the poor things have no hope of any sort. They are seen as lower species of animals such as pigs. They are very shadow and the sound of their voices are defiling. They have no place in the abode of the gods and no hope of getting liberation except that they might be born among the higher castes after having gone through millions of reincarnations. In other words, if a low caste person served faithfully like a slave, they might be reincarnated as a person of the traitor caste or a warrior caste. If they kept doing this over and over, being reincarnated and moving up the caste system, eventually they could be born into the Brahmin class. According to this doctrine, a man is liable to be born 8,400,000 times before he can become a Brahmin. And except one be a Brahmin, he is not fit to be reabsorbed into the spirit. So it sounds like the Brahmin caste was at the top of the system. Yeah, Brahmins were considered spiritual leaders and the head of society. If Brahmins did enough good works, they, and only they, they could earn their way out of this cycle of reincarnation. And then what did they think happened after that? Did they believe they'd go to heaven? Mm, Sometimes they'd use that word heaven, but I don't want you to picture what we picture when we go to heaven. We know that when we get to heaven, we are going to be with Jesus. But Hindus saw God as an impersonal force. And when a Brahmin finally did enough good deeds, he would just disappear into that impersonal force. He is reabsorbed into the spirit and ceases to be an individual. Basically, Their goal was to just cease being, for their spirit to get lost in the Great Spirit. As an example, they described how a river would get lost when it reaches the ocean. So Pandita Ramabai's father was a Brahmin, the highest caste. So her life must have been easier compared to the lower caste. You know what? I always thought that until I started researching Pandita's life. And that's not necessarily true. There's something else that can be hard for us to wrap our heads around when we are not familiar with the system. Brahmin men were considered leaders. They had an opportunity to escape a cycle of reincarnation, but Brahmin women had no such hope, and they lived really difficult lives. Here's where I want to say I love that the scriptures teach us that Jesus loved women so preciously. Yes. Most Brahmin fathers believed they received spiritual merit by teaching and investing in, you guessed it, their sons. A son is the most coveted of all blessings that a Hindu craves. For it is by a son's birth in the family that the father is redeemed. But women, on the other hand, they were seen as a liability. Fathers had to marry daughters to members of their own caste, but those fathers had to pay their new sons-in-law. So women were not viewed as something to be treasured. They were viewed as an extra expense. Fathers very seldom wish to have daughters, for they are thought to be the property of somebody else. Besides, a daughter is not supposed to be of any use to the parents in their old age. 
Ramabai describes friends coming to celebrate the birth of a child. If a boy is born, his birth is announced with music, glad songs, and by distributing sweetmeats. If a daughter, the father coolly announces that nothing has been born into his family. The friends go home grave and quiet. She knew of families who made horrific choices after having a daughter. After considering how many girls could safely be allowed to live, the father took good care to defend himself from caste and clan tyranny by killing the extra girls at birth, which was as easily accomplished as destroying a mosquito or other annoying insect. Who can save a babe if the parents are determined to slay her and eagerly watch for a suitable opportunity? Opium is generally used to keep the crying child quiet. And a small pill of this drug is sufficient to accomplish the cruel task. A skillful pressure upon the neck, which is known as the putting nail to the throat, also answers the purpose. I just can't imagine that. Oh, me either. But you know, the sad thing, Erin, is that something similar is happening in our country. We call it abortion. In light of all of this, Pandita Ramabai's father was radical. His name was Anant Sastri Dangre. Okay, <laughs> that seems like a difficult but very important name to remember. Let's go with Anant. Anant. Let's go back to before Ramabai was born. Anant wanted to teach his first wife to read Sanskrit and read the Hindu scriptures for herself. That seems reasonable. Yeah, but in this society, women were not allowed to read the holy books. Anant's idea was unheard of. Anant said no such prohibition existed in the holy books themselves. He said that rule was just a human-made custom. So he convinced the gurus in his area to let him teach his wife to read. Then he went to his first wife, eager to begin her religious education, and she said, no way. I'm not supposed to read the holy books. Oh, no. But then she died. Anant got married again to, uh, I'm not sure you're ready for this, a nine-year-old. No, there. I'm not ready for that. And there's a whole lot in this story that makes me more and more thankful, again, mm. for how Christianity views and calls for women to be treated. Mm. How old was Anant when he married that nine-year-old? Well, he was 44. What? Oh, yeah. So not ready, Aaron. No, I have a nine-year-old. I cannot imagine this. And I'm pretty close to 44. So this is wild. Now, now's probably a good time to explain something else. We said that high caste women had tough lives. And one reason why they did is because they were given in marriage very young. Yeah, nine years is very young. Mm -hmm. Giving a daughter in marriage was considered a good deed, though. The earlier the act of giving the daughter in marriage, the greater is the merit. For thereby, the parents are entitled to rich rewards in heaven. When fathers found an eligible bachelor within their caste, they took that opportunity. A great many girls are given in marriage, literally while they're still in their cradles. From 5 to 11 years is the usual period for their marriage among the Brahmins all over India. A betrothed girl like this would usually go to live with her husband's family. Generations of family lived together, and the bride had to obey her mother-in-law. Breaking the young bride's spirits is an essential part of the discipline of this new abode. So these child brides didn't have much time for school, maybe two or three years. Girls of nine and ten, when recently out of school and given in marriage, are wholly cut off from reading or writing. Because it is a shame for a young woman or girl to hold a paper or book in her hand or to read in the presence of others in her husband's house. These marriages weren't consummated until the brides became teenagers. At that point, a bride would basically live as a slave to her husband, shut up in the house, cut off from the world. And here's something else that's hard for us to understand. A family could be high caste and also be poor. Rich, high-caste families would take the most eligible bachelors, and that made poor, high-caste girls even more vulnerable. Poor parents cannot have the advantage of marrying their daughters to boys of prosperous families, and as they must marry them to someone, 
it very frequently happens that girls of 8 or 9 are given to men of 60 and 70 or to men completely unworthy of the young maidens. So 44-year-old Anant married a 9-year-old wife named Laxmabai. And when she became old enough, they eventually began a new family. And that's how Pandita Ramabai came into the world. She and her brother and sister joined their parents in spending all their time studying Hindu religious texts and doing what they thought were good deeds. Okay, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I have to ask a question, Erin. Was Ramabai given in marriage at a young age? It's a great question, and you'd think so, but her dad, Anant, was a reformer. He did not give Ramabai in marriage as a child. And defying custom... She learned Sanskrit from her parents and became quite a religious scholar. At first, they had a home in the mountains, but as part of doing good deeds, Anant gave away all his money. The family began trekking across the country. My father and mother were always traveling from one sacred place to another, staying in each place for some months, bathing in the sacred river or tank, visiting temples, and worshipping the images of gods in the temples. They would quote religious texts in public, and people would give them gifts of food, money, or clothing. Kind of reminds me of street preachers serving for donations from the public. Yeah, it's a good parallel. And this worked for Pandita's family for a while. People thought they were earning spiritual merit by giving to them. But then a famine came, and they just couldn't keep up this lifestyle. Ramabai's father, mother, and sister all died. She was 16 years old. We are too proud to beg or to do menial work and ignorant of any way of earning an honest living. Nothing but starvation was before us. My father, mother, and sister all died of starvation within a few months of each other. Ramabai had spent her life studying Hinduism and pursuing good works like bathing in holy rivers and trekking to special places, but she didn't feel like any of this was getting her closer to God. My brother and I survived. For more than three years after the death of our parents and elder sister, we wandered from place to place, visiting many temples, bathing in many rivers, fasting and performing penances, worshipping gods, trees, and animals. We had walked more than 4,000 miles on foot without any sort of comfort. We had fulfilled all the conditions laid down in the sacred books and kept all the rules as far as our knowledge went. But the gods were not pleased with us and did not appear to us. As this brother-sister duo visited temples, they discovered some dishonest priests. And these priests would manipulate pilgrims for their own gain. Mm. Did that impact Ramabai's faith in Hinduism? It did. But when she and her brother arrived in Calcutta, many of the Brahmins were there. And they were amazed by her learning. They had never met a woman with such a scholarly background. And some of the gurus in Calcutta said, the goddess of learning has come to us in human form. Mm, Whoa. Yeah. (laughs) The Hindu goddess of learning was named Sarasvati. These gurus bestowed that name on Ramabai. So sometimes you see her name written as Pandita Ramabai Sarasvati. Okay, but wasn't her given name Pandita Ramabai? Actually, no. The word Pandit was a title of honor given to men with great knowledge. No woman had ever been a Pandit before. Mm. But Ramabai was so knowledgeable that leaders made a feminine version of that title and gave it to her. That's why she's called Pandita Ramabai. Mm, Okay, so it sounds like her deep knowledge of Hinduism was beginning to gain her some prestige and notoriety. Exactly. And about the same time that her star was rising, Ramabai encountered British missionaries. They gave her a Bible in Sanskrit. Reading it didn't have an immediate effect, but a seed must have been planted. Meanwhile, she dug right back into those Hindu texts. She had gotten an assignment to teach the women in Calcutta, and she wanted to prepare. So she reread the ancient documents, and she grew more and more disturbed. She read texts like this one. A faithful wife 
who desires to dwell after death with her husband must never do anything that might displease him who took her hand, whether he be alive or dead. Ramabai realized both the ancient texts and the tradition viewed women in a very bad light. Women of high and low caste, as a class, were bad, very bad, worse than demons. The only hope of their getting this much desired liberation from karma and its results, that is, countless millions of births and deaths and untold suffering, was the worship of their husbands. A husband must be constantly worshipped as a god by a faithful wife. The husband is said to be the woman's god. There is no other god for her. If a wife obeys her husband, she will for that reason alone be exalted in heaven. Gradually, my eyes were being opened. I was waking up to my own hopeless condition as a woman. So, she made a huge choice. At age 22, Ramabai radically challenged tradition. She married a man from the lowest caste. Intermarriages cannot take place without involving serious consequences and making the offenders outcasts. Okay, Erin, I am imagining that this decision represented a break from the religious tradition she'd spent her whole life studying. Yeah, I think you're imagining correctly. Then, after less than two years of marriage, Ramabai's husband died. She was left alone with a one-year-old daughter. Oh, wow. So she became a widow. Was she now in about her mid-20s? Yeah, still really young. So we need to pause and talk about yet another problem high caste women face in this society. Throughout India, widowhood is regarded as a punishment for a horrible crime or crimes committed by the woman in her former existence upon earth. Widows were often blamed for their husband's deaths. They were shut up in their houses by their family, yet vilified at the same time. And on top of that, they could not get remarried. Oh, so they were forced to be widows for life? Mm Mm-hmm. And here's one thing that made widowhood so hard, besides the loss of their husband. Wives were told to focus on their outward appearances. But in widowhood, that suddenly changed. No sooner does the husband die. Then they are deprived of every gold and silver ornament, of the bright colored garments, and of all the things they love to have about or on their persons. Ramabai knew of one group of widows whose heads were shaved every two weeks. What woman is there who does not love the wealth of soft and glossy hair with which nature has so generously decorated her head? A Hindu woman thinks it worse than death to lose her beautiful hair. Girls of 14 and 15 who hardly know the reason why they are so cruelly deprived of everything they like are often seen wearing sad countenances, their eyes swollen from shedding bitter tears. They are glad to find a dark corner where they may hide their faces as if they had done something shameful and criminal. The widow must wear a single coarse garment, white, red, or brown. She must eat only one meal during the 24 hours of a day. She must never take part in family feasts and jubilees with others. And think about it. Women were getting married at eight or nine years old to older men. So that meant there were a lot of widows. Girls of nine and 10 or 13 years of age whose betrothed husbands are dead, are virgin widows. And these, if of high caste families, must remain single throughout life. Many wives would jump into the cremation flames at their husband's funeral and die because they didn't want to live as widows. This practice was starting to diminish, but Ramabai still knew of women doing it. She wrote to people in the United States and Great Britain, raising awareness of what was happening in her home country. Mothers and fathers, compare the condition of your own sweet darlings at your happy firesides with that of millions of little girls of a corresponding age in India, who have already been sacrificed on the unholy altar of an inhuman social custom 
and then ask yourselves whether you can stop short of doing something to rescue the little widows from the hands of their tormentors. So did Pandita Ramabai have to live this way when she became a widow? No. She'd already grown disillusioned with Hinduism. She had already defied social customs by marrying outside of her caste. And now, in 1883, she left her country and went to England. Now, England had its own social problems, but Ramabai noticed how believers in Jesus were taking action to address the needs of the poor and the hurting. I began to think that there was a real difference between Hinduism and Christianity. She was especially moved to see former prostitutes receive new life in Christ. One of the Christians told her Jesus loved women, even women society had rejected. She spoke of the infinite love of Christ for sinners. He did not despise them, but came to save them. I had never read or heard anything like this in the religious books of the Hindus. After reading the fourth chapter of St. John's Gospel, I realized that Christ was truly the divine Savior He claimed to be, and no one but He could transform and uplift the downtrodden womanhood of India and of every land. Thus, my heart was drawn to the religion of Christ. Pandita Ramabai was baptized in the Church of England in 1883. She lived in England and then moved to the United States. She raised her daughter and continued her studies in English, in math, in biblical Hebrew and Greek. But she never forgot about the hurting women of India. The one thing needful for the general diffusion of education among women in India is a body of persons from among themselves. Who shall make it their life work to teach by precept and example their fellow countrywomen? And so she returned. In 1889, Pandita Ramabai went back to India and started a school for girls. It was six years since she had left. I felt as if I were going to a strange country and to a strange people. Everything seemed quite dark before me. I fell on my knees, committed myself to the care of our loving Heavenly Father, and sailed. As she left, some doubts plagued her mind. My religious belief was so vague at the time that I was not certain whether I would go to heaven or hell after my death. I was not prepared to meet my God. Helen Dyer was a British missionary who watched a new school take shape. It was not long before pupils began to come in, including a specially bright group of little girls from 10 to 12 years of age. It was difficult to believe that the latter rested under the cruel ban of widowhood. They were genuine Hindu widows with shaven heads, plain brick red garments and no jewellery. They come from homes where they have been treated as outcasts. No love bestowed upon them and no comforts provided for them. I wish them to learn what the outside world is like from pictures and books and to enjoy the wonderful works of God as they ramble in the garden study with the microscope or view the heavens from the veranda on the roof. Ramabai wanted these hurting young women to experience the genuine love of Jesus. And three years after this school opened its doors, Ramabai herself experienced that same love. Okay, wow, Erin. Let's pause and just review where we've been so far. It it seems like through this whole story, Pandita Ramabai has been striving to connect with God. And at first she saw him as an impersonal spirit demanding good works. Right, but she could never do enough. She would have to do good works up to eight million lifetimes to have a chance to work her way to God. But listen, our purpose isn't to single out Hinduism. Everyone is trying to strive, to earn merit, to justify their existence. Everyone. Deep down, we all know we're missing something. And we all feel like we have to do something to make up for our shortcomings. Not all of us bathe in holy rivers or worship at shrines like a young Ramabai did, but we're all tempted to pursue our own types of idols. I think Western churches are filled with people trying to do enough good works to make themselves right with God. And unbelievers everywhere are just trying to prove themselves when they climb up the ladder of success. Mm. But the reality is that our sin, our rebellion against God, makes it impossible for us to do enough to get right with Him. 
Yeah, we can never work our way up the system because God is perfect and our sin separates us from Him. Aaron, it sounds like Ramabai had understood that intellectually and been baptized, but she kind of just traded one religion for another. Yeah, she knew about Jesus, but lots of people know about Jesus. Three years after moving back to India and starting the school, Ramabai actually got to know Jesus. I have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and have the joy of sweet communion with Him. My life is full of joy, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. She realized Jesus became a man and lived a perfect life. He was the only one to deserve merit for his actions, yet he became an outcast. He was punished for our sin when he died on the cross. Mm, Yeah. When we come to faith in him, we receive his righteousness. And we don't need to earn any merit on our own. Jesus rose again, giving us the hope for eternal life with a loving father. Mm, Ramabai could stop striving. Instead, she could lean entirely on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I can scarcely contain the joy and keep it to myself. I feel like the Samaritan woman who left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the man, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Some parents of the school didn't like Ramabai's new passion for Jesus, and they removed their students. But many other students also found hope in Christ. I feel I must tell my fellow creatures what great things the Lord Jesus has done for me. And I feel sure as it was possible for him to save such a great sinner as I am, he's quite able to save others. The only thing that must be done by me is to tell people of him and of his love for sinners and his great power to save them. In fact, some American financial supporters of the school threatened to cut off their funds. These donors claimed to be Christians, but they were uncomfortable with Ramabai's excitement to share the gospel. But that didn't stop her. Because a necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. I am bound to tell as many men and women as possible that Christ Jesus came to save sinners like me. Ramabai imagined a place where students could not only learn to read, but would also learn the Bible and build God's kingdom. I wished very much that there were some missions founded in this country, which would be a testimony to the Lord's faithfulness to His people and the truthfulness of what the Bible says in a practical way. I questioned in my mind over and over again why some missionaries did not come forward to found faith missions in India. Then the Lord said to me, why don't you begin to do this yourself instead of wishing for others to do it? Pandita Ramabai bought 100 acres of land and founded the Mukti Mission. Students there could learn farming and the ministry could sustain itself. Her daughter served alongside her and would one day run the whole mission. Wow, stirs my heart. God gave Ramabai the ability to do something about the lack of education in her culture, especially for girls. Yeah, but her challenges were far from over. In 1896, once again, a famine devastated India. That had to bring back some painful memories because, you know, Ramabai's parents and sister had died in that previous famine. Right, but this time, she and her team traveled to the places most affected. They tracked down orphans and invited students by the hundreds to the school. Girls came, boys came, receiving an education, practical life training, and most importantly, hearing the gospel. In 1905, Ramabai heard about revivals happening throughout the world. So she gathered 70 people to begin to pray for revival in India. And in the next few years, this ministry saw hundreds of people put their faith in Jesus Christ. They have had their eyes opened by reading the Word of God. And many of them have been truly converted and saved, saved to the praise and glory of God. I thank God for letting me see several hundred of my sisters, the children of my love and prayer, gloriously saved. By 1907, she wrote, There are over 1,500 people living here, 
We are not rich nor great, but we are happy, getting our daily bread directly from the loving hands of our Heavenly Father, having not a piece over and above our daily necessities, having no banking account anywhere, no endowment or income from any earthly source, but depending altogether on our Father God. We have nothing to fear from anybody, nothing to lose, and nothing to regret. The Lord is our inexhaustible treasure. Ramabai embarked on her final grand work while all this was happening. She translated the Bible into Marathi. What's Marathi? It was the common language in the area she lived. The ministry printed Ramabai's translation and gave the copies away, charging nothing. She died on April 5th, 1922, at 63 years old. She was a mother, a scholar, an educator, and an agent of social reform. So inspired by this beautiful woman's life. Erin, how is her life still impacting people today? Well, the Mukti Mission is still serving orphans, the poor, widows, and people with disabilities. Wow, I am so encouraged. What an amazing story. Nancy, aren't you encouraged by this woman's life? Yeah, it's been so fun for me to be reminded of how God used this woman. A little known today, but really she made such a significant contribution in her day. And by the way, thanks to you and Aaron for telling us this story, being our guides, and introducing us to this really special woman. Well, thank you, Nancy, because before you mentioned her to us, she was not on my radar, and I am a Christian biography fanatic, so I'm going to be soaking up a lot on her life in the coming weeks. You know, I'm thinking Ramabai was born in a time when all women were really looked at as unremarkable, But God did remarkable things through her. And isn't that the case when you look back at anybody that God uses in the history of the church throughout the scripture and in the years since then and today? You know, we all feel unremarkable, I think, most of the time. I mean, we know we're ordinary, we're inadequate to accomplish God-sized things in our world, and I was just sharing with a group of our ambassadors this past week and saying hardly a day goes by that I don't feel really inadequate and unqualified to do what God has called me to do. And I think that's a good position to be in because the fact is, yes, we're created in the image of God, but in and of ourselves, apart from Him, there's nothing really remarkable about us. The secret is that we serve a remarkable God. And He can do amazing things in our lives according to His will and His pleasure and however He chooses to use us. Well, as we've been sharing with you all this month, Aaron, along with numerous others on the Revive Our Hearts team, have produced a short book called Unremarkable. As we've been telling you, it's a collection of stories about 10 different women, including Pandita Ramabai, who were used by God to serve Him and to serve others in remarkable ways. And one of the things I especially appreciate about this short book is that each chapter is followed by a set of questions to help us make these stories personal. So Aaron, I'd love if you would just read for us one of the questions that helps us follow up the story of Ramabai. Sure, I'm happy to. Here's one. As Pandita Ramabai studied Hindu law, she found the practices futile, and hopeless. Through her dissatisfaction, God drew her to himself. What are some ways that God has used dissatisfaction in your own life to show you that he is the only one who can truly satisfy your soul? Dana, can you think of some way that God has used dissatisfaction in your life to remind you that he's the only one who can truly satisfy your soul? Well, I would say at this point in my life, everything that dissatisfies me, whether it's a decision or a disappointment, that always makes me run back to Him. It always makes me go to Him and say, help. And my mentor this year has me praying the prayer, Lord, bind my will to Your will. And so there's no way that a disappointment or dissatisfaction could do anything more but drive me into His heart if I'm praying that. Yeah. As we often say here, anything that makes us need God is a blessing, right? Yeah. Erin, what about you? Can you think of a way that God has used dissatisfaction in your life to show you that He's the one who can truly satisfy you? 
Well, I've got some stuff going on in my body right now that ranges from annoying to really, really disheartening. And I don't like it. I don't like some of the changes I'm having to make. I don't like some of the medicines I'm having to take, but it has pressed me back towards God and His Word, towards listening anew to those things He says about rest and about seeking Him first. So I don't love that I'm having to learn those lessons the hard way, but God is certainly using them. Well, thanks for sharing that, Aaron. And I think you probably just spoke up for others who may be listening to us right now who are maybe dealing with similar things. And Lord, I do just pray for Erin and for her body, which you made. Mm -hmm. And I pray that you would touch her, that you would assure her of your grace, that you would give her peace, that you'd give her wisdom to know what steps to take and how to navigate this. And most of all, I pray for Dana, for Erin, for myself, and for every person listening to this conversation that you would use the things that are frustrating to us in this season to press us to your heart and to help us find deeper heart satisfaction in you. Amen. And really, this is the kind of discussion that's going to be generated, I hope, by this new book from Revive Our Hearts called Unremarkable. And Dana and Aaron, I wish we could have an hour or two to just sit down and continue this conversation, but I hope that groups of women everywhere, whether it's on the phone or Zoom or in person, will be having these kinds of conversations around the chapters in this book. So I hope that you'll get a copy. I know you're going to be inspired by the stories of these women. So as you read each chapter, I want to encourage you to dig into the questions and better yet, go through it with a group of other women and sharpen each other as you do. Mm -hmm. In fact, we'd like to send you this new book, Unremarkable, when you support Revive Our Hearts with a gift of any size. This book is available exclusively through Revive Our Hearts. And I want you to know that your gift is going to help us continue encouraging you each day through the podcast and radio program. You can make your donation by visiting reviveourhearts.com. And after you make your donation, you can check a box to say, yes, I'd like a copy of Unremarkable. You can also ask for it when you call 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. Thank you so much for your support of this ministry, for your prayers. We need them, and they're a huge blessing to us. And thank you, Aaron, for joining us today. And I'm so grateful for you, for your work as our content manager, and also for your hosting each week of the Grounded Videocast podcast. If you haven't seen or heard that, go to the Reviver Hearts YouTube or Facebook page, and you can catch up on recent episodes of that. Mm, thanks for having me on. What a fun discussion this has been. To be continued. Well, speaking of continuing, tomorrow on Revive Our Hearts, Angie Smith was at her friend's baby shower, praying for the health of this new mom and the baby she was carrying. You've been there. But this particular time, Angie found it really difficult because she herself was pregnant and she knew that the baby she was carrying had serious medical problems. We'll hear how she was able to pray for God to bless her friend and her baby while Angie was preparing to face her own storms. Be sure to join us tomorrow as once again we ask the Lord to revive our hearts. Revive Our Hearts keeps pointing you to the God who can do remarkable things. It's an outreach of Life Action Ministries.